Gentlemen, appreciate you guys uh, carving out some time today. I'm looking forward to diving into all things uh, HIT training and very low carb diets. But before we do, uh, could you give us a quick whirlwind tour, Prof? I know we've had you on the podcast a few times. And of course, Lucas, it'd be great to hear about your background as well. Sure, I'll, I'll start in, Mark. Thanks. First of all, thanks for having us. So I think my, my, my general shtick is I'm uh, an exercise and sports science researcher, failed athlete, and I've dove into that for the last 30 years, lots of publications. But uh, and, and at the end of the day, I, I made a, um, a business called Hit Science. And uh, yeah, we, we basically, it's, uh, we put all of our research of HIT into kind of an online course and, and program. And I still am fortunate to be able to do research studies with people like, uh, like Lucas. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation, I very appreciate it. Uh, I'm not as famous as Paul, so I need to introduce myself a, a bit more. And uh, I'm from Czech Republic. I, I work at uh, Ostrava University. Uh, it's uh, uh, like uh, west of the Czech Republic. I focus on exercise physiology and uh, nutrition. So I think that we've been uh, colleagues with Paul like uh, five, six, seven years or something like that. Uh, we've got uh, many publications together and uh, I appreciate a great support from Paul uh, from the very beginning of my uh, research career at the university. So um, I used to start with a HIT, high intensity interval training, but now it's more, uh, a bit more to exercise and nutrition and a low carb diet. So maybe it's uh, enough as a short introduction. Oh, that's terrific. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we're in January, people are trying to get fit, they're trying to get healthy. We've seen over the last, unfortunately, year and a half or two years of COVID that, uh, you know, weight gain is not good for our overall health, for our immune systems. And now we've got more obese people around the world than underweight individuals, which is a little alarming. And, you know, right. you point out in your in your research as well that, you know, even of the 20 to 40 percent of people who are, quote unquote, normal weight or non-obese are actually holding on to more body fat than would be ideal. And this term is over fat. So could you, Lucas, walk us through, you know, or, or Paul, you know, this term and what the potential adverse effects are for health for the individuals who would be classified as overfat. Sure. Well, I'll start in. And uh, I think it all stems from the problem, Mark, that uh, we're classifying fatness with weight on a scale. And, you know, we're, I've, I've been as guilty as the next person in this, where you're, you're, you're jumping on the scale and you're, you're having a look at what that number reads. But what could that number be? It could be anything. It could be could be water weight. It's going to change if you go to the toilet. It's a real blend of everything. It doesn't mean anything, unfortunately. It's really, or at least, doesn't mean much. It's it's, uh, and that's the problem. Is we're using things. You know, you'll know BMI, right? Body mass index. People will be familiar um, with that that measure. That's basically comparing your height with your with your weight. And if you're that weight number half happens to be different than the levels say, then, well, we're going to put you and make you obese or, or make you, you know, yeah, we're, you're going to be the obese category. Right, well, yeah. Mark, I'm, I'm an athlete, right? And I've been obese in the, uh, uh, in, in the BMI scale before I've been over 25 and I've been uh, looking pretty ripped, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's just, it really all sort of stems from that. And um, credit to our other colleague on the paper, Phil Maftone, and Phil has really, he's brought, I don't think he was the first, but he re, he's, he's written books on it and whatnot. And he's, he's really, um, and we're trying to change these terms. We shouldn't be, be calling us um, obese and overweight. It's really, it's, it's over fat. And over fat really is any level of excess body fat that causes um, metabolic ill health ultimately. So it's, it's, it's impairing your health. If something's going wrong, because we know we can have a low weight, but too much fat, usually in the midriff. And this is something's going on there where there's this whole inflammatory process going on. And we are, we're not health. We're, we're really, we're really limited in terms of our functions as humans. 
So it really all sort of stems from that. And this is unfortunately the, you know, Phil and I estimate it's over 80% of the world's population actually may fall into this category, but it's, it's, it's inappropriately measured because we're using that darn scale. Yeah, it's amazing how much noise there is with the scale. Something that uh, you know you, you realize when you work with weight making athletes or boxers or MMA fighters because you could take off massive amounts of weight in 24 hours and put it back on. And like you said, that's not body fat. And you know, with the general population, they struggle because they're so they're hanging on every move of the scale to dictate whether or not they're making the right choices. And of course, that's difficult because it takes a while for some of these good habits to actually take effect. And so, you know, we know that. Shifting over to HIT exercise, we know that exercise improves cardiorespiratory fitness. We know it improves a lot of these metabolic markers, even independent of weight loss. But how does HIT in particular start to support some of those those markers, some of those pathways for better, you know, cardiovascular and metabolic health? Well, if I can just continue on there, Lucas, yeah. um, I, I think the the HIT is, and again, I've I've got a whole business into this, and you know, 150 publications in the area, so. It, it's clearly a benefit. We shouldn't be throwing this away because we're going to get to the study that kind of compared, you know, what you can do to, to adjust your health ultimately is, um, but hit, hit is, is really benefit beneficial from that, that, that perspective, because it's, it is having effects on the entire engine of the human body, right. From the, from the heart muscle. Um, we know that it's, you know, when you're doing hit exercise appropriately, then you know your 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 whole cardiovascular system your your heart and your lungs they're working hard and adapting accordingly right with larger stroke volumes greater delivery uh, of oxygenated blood to the working muscles the working muscles are developing more mitochondria as a result of this martin gabella's work is has mm -hmm. shown this and and again as as short as you know six 30 second bouts done really really hard can be very effective at, at at adjusting this, which is which is great. So it's I guess we're you know we're we're kind of getting to the main message. What we sort of feel is is probably appropriate is use hit to to hit these physiological targets or these if you're trying to improve your function as a human uh, and your ability to kind of get through the day. That's very appropriate. We all need to be doing that, but what we'll get to this with the study is, is what we found is that it didn't really do too much to your over fatness, which were, you know, and that was, there was a, you know, diet was the more important factor here. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to dive in. I like the little teaser there. It's great. Um, but it, it, I mean, it is amazing how in this time press society and everyone's citing lack of time as, as a big issue with being able to train enough. And we know that 150 minutes per week recommendation you know, what, barely 20%. So one out of five people might be achieving that. And so how are we going to get more time efficient and whether it's, you know, attenuating oxidative stress or increasing antioxidant capacity, you know, improving endothelial function, all these things that people struggle with when we, when they come into clinic and they're 20 or 30 pounds overweight and they're slightly hypertensive and they're struggling. But one of the questions I still get asked a lot is around this, you know, steady state, moderate, continuous exercise and hit when it comes to body composition changes in general in the literature, you know, apart from, from the work here, what is it telling us? Is there one that's superior or do they, does it shake out to be the same in the long run? I don't think we, we can't tease it out from this particular data set, Mark. Um, I, I'm, I could only just sort of give you my opinion. Yeah. Um, and that's that, I mean, the, all forms of exercise have, have their place. Uh, again, one thing that we're really harping on as well in our, in our course and, and business is that context is, is key. And, uh, you know, it's so for, if we're, if we're, if we're talking to, uh, certain athletes and stuff, then all of these forms of exercise are going to be amazing. Right. Um, polarized program where there are lots of, lots of exercises done at a low intensity, moderate intensity for mid zone sort of athletes, and high intensity for all the gamut of team sport athletes and others that are healthy. The problem is, is that if you're unhealthy and if we're talking to the larger general population that you mentioned, not getting that dose, they might kind of already be coming in with these heightened um, unhealthy sort of profiles, right? Or cortisol levels are already sort of through the roof from their difficult lifestyles right and then you're throwing in some hit to this well if that's all you've sort of got time to do maybe it's good but maybe 
you know, again, the context will totally yeah. depend. Unfortunately, you know, we all want that blanket do this. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. we, I don't think you can really give a recommendation you must do hit to lose weight. And we certainly can't find that from the study. Uh, or we can't say that from the study because that didn't happen. We, you know, when... <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll jump into now. I'm going to circle back on the athlete front here as we as we get through the other side of the study. But you know, interested now, Lucas, to tell us. Obviously, we know that nutrition, exercise are key pillars for improving health, improving body composition. So, can you walk us through the aim of the study and how you guys uh, set things up? Okay, no problem. Uh, yeah, you've you've mentioned exercise and diet as a key uh, stuff uh, about body mass. Uh, management and maintenance. Maybe I would add uh, behavioral therapy as well, because this is not just about how to exercise, how which diet is better or worse, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, the, parties, uh, the, the guys, the overfit participants usually struggle with uh, how to keep it in everyday life. Yeah, how to integrate it. It's so challenging, right? Yeah, so some other, something like, you know, something called behavioral therapy is a very important part. So I would uh, base it on three pillars, exercise, diet, and uh, these uh, advices, how, mm-hmm. how to manage that. Uh, okay, so regarding our uh, study, uh, obviously there's some um, popular approaches in uh, diet, like low carb, very low carb, high fat diet. And uh, from the exercise perspective, there, there's a high intensity interval training. So um, our question was, uh, which one, if we can use them in uh, overfed uh, individuals, which one is better? Or do we need both of them in one time? Uh, will be there some extra effect if we add hit to low carb diet or if we add mm-hmm. a low carb diet to, to, to hit? So that was a primary aim, which approach is uh, better exercise alone, diet alone, or both of them. Mm-hmm. So um, what were uh, some of the characteristics, Lucas, of some of those participants? Uh, yeah, the participants were uh, adults, uh, overfed adults uh, from 20 to, to 60 years old. Uh, they were without any medications, without any confirmed chronic diseases. So this was a high risk uh, population or high, high risk groups uh, of developing some uh, chronic diseases like uh, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure and so on and so on. So a highly risk uh, group. Um, yeah, that's just uh, basic uh, characteristics of the participants. And uh, most of all, uh, of all, they were overfed and inactive. So no regular exercise, no diet, no specific diet on. Okay, so uh, we allocated them uh, randomly to four study groups. The first group was just exercise. The second group was the just diet group, low carb, high fat diet. The third one was the combination of both. And the fourth last study group was a control. Uh, participants in the control group didn't change anything, didn't change their inactivity, didn't change their diet or whatever. And for that diet, Lucas, what, is, what was the amount in terms of carbohydrate? Is it for that 50 gram mark or what? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the main aim for participants were to stay below 50 grams gotcha. of carbohydrates per day. And uh, they uh, should have to compensate this uh, energy restriction from the carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrates uh, by increasing in the good fat intake and uh, keep the protein intake like uh, average or uh, similar like before the study. So it was actually low carb, high fat diet, not high protein. We should say it's uh, well formulated too, right? To steal like a Jeff Volek kind of kind of term there too, right? So it's yeah, they weren't just they weren't just gorging on butter, right? Like they were there was a nutritionist involved, and I think that's a really important aspect of this too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and what were some of the fats and uh, Lucas and Paul that we were directed towards to, to be able to make up that difference? Right. We advised them to, to use some natural 
uh, fats like butter, uh, olive oils, and uh, lard, and uh, this the, the stuff. So yep. we advise them to to avoid some overconsumption of some um, other oils, like uh, plant oils, and uh, using them for cooking and uh, and so on. Coconut oil as well. Tremendous, and you know, at the end of the was. It- Eight weeks, twelve weeks. Yeah, it was a twelve weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, we analyze, we measure them uh, every month, so every four weeks after four, eight, and twelve weeks, and uh, we did many measurements, and we wanted to take a look from many perspectives. Uh, this this paper, which is uh, already published, just focus on one part of the outcomes. It was uh, body composition, cardio, uh, respiratory fitness level, but uh, we've got uh, much more data just about finishing the, the following paper uh, about some um, inflammation, uh, um, insulin resistance, and, and so on and so on, and and maybe what's it, what is unique, and we are just about preparing is also is we've got some uh, psychological data as well. Interesting. So, uh, because you know, I, I always prefer, and I like this holistic uh, point of perspective, uh, not just uh, focusing on one uh, marker mm-hmm. and uh, do some uh, extra uh, conclusions, some big conclusions. But uh, I think that this holistic approach is very important because, um, and it's my experience, uh, sometimes all the markers don't fit to each other and it's quite a difficult to conclude something easy <laughs> yeah good in this kind of complex problems it's uh yeah having a real b- big view that thirty thousand foot view of all these different parameters is really important and you know at, at the end of the the 12 weeks when we come to these groups you know how was that very low carb diet affecting body composition was it enhanced with the hit training was there you know can you walk us through that uh, okay, so uh, the low carb diet, either in alone or in iso- isolation or in combination with uh, exercise, uh, induce a substantial changes or decrease in uh, visceral adipose tissue because we focus not on a whole body fat, but uh, the most um, important, I guess, is uh, especially visceral adipose tissue. Mm-hmm. So uh, these uh, body mass variables decreased, uh, especially in both diet groups, and uh, no matter if there was a uh, hit or not. So hit alone, hit alone did not cause such effects on body composition. By other ways, it, it improved exercise capacity. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. And would you say that's to do with the length of the study or, or why is it that we didn't see such changes with the hit? Is it just the amount, the amount of time that they're actually exercising in a week or um, what are some potential areas there? Uh, yeah, the, the, the duration of the study, 12 weeks, it's, um, I must say, quite uh, short to conclude that this is um, uh, some uh, something that we can uh, uh, carry to some uh, long life uh, conclusions, uh, but still it show us some uh, important stuff like that uh, if we want to manage our body mass for a long time, it can't happen without diet changes. Exercise alone will probably not cause such a positive effect. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean on the flip side, like you said, when you look at both the very low carb, high fat diet and you know, whether they added the hit or not, we're achieving these significant changes. And it's interesting that this is a just an you know, just an overfat group and not even an obese group, which we'd obviously see even more pronounced effects, most likely, right, Paul? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and again, remember, obese is a BMI classification. Mm-hmm. So, but I know it, it obese creates a picture in our brain. So you can still be mm-hmm. overfat is is still a, an obese person in, in theory. Mm-hmm. But yeah, just commentary on the on some of the 
things I was hearing there. And uh, to me, I mean, I, I think 12 weeks is pretty long. Like I think like 12 weeks, that's three months. Yeah. If I'm going to the gym for three months, <laughs> I'm expecting I'm going to see some changes in my, you know, whatever my body composition in three months, if just from doing that, that workout. And we didn't see that, but we did see it in both diet groups. So something is going on there in the diet that seems to be more important than going to the gym and just doing hit. Um, and that, that, that really runs in the face of, of, you know, that those new year's resolutions that we're going to go to the gym now and we're going to do hit. And that's, you know, um, it, it says that great, we can do that for our cardiovascular fitness because those variables did go up. That was, if we were functionally better as human beings. However, if maybe more aesthetics and health are, are important, you better look at your cleaning up your diet. You know what I mean? You can't go and gouge on your Gatorade and whatnot while you're, while you're doing that hit exercise, that's just not going to help you. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's great to see that obviously the hit groups getting fitter. And so all those markers we talked about earlier are improving, but like you said, if we're not thinking about the fueling side, then we're leaving a whole bunch of potential benefits and gains on the table there. And when you, when you guys looked at Lucas, like the, the beta hydroxybutyrate concentrations, obviously increasing more significantly as you're restricting carbohydrates, um, you know, which we see in, in, in many other studies, but you guys talked about some of the different pattern changes that were potentially different between that very low carb, high fat group on its own versus that very low carb, high fat group that was actually doing the hit training as well. Can you talk about that? Yeah, we saw a different pattern in uh, the group uh, of diet and exercise altogether. And uh, it was a much more oscillation of uh, uh, the uh, ketones uh, from the capillary blood. And uh, I, I was happy to, to see when uh, our colleague Daniel Plus just confirmed that uh, when he saw that, he said, oh, that's what I see in everyday practice with my athletes. So that, that is great when you've got some uh, science results and it's confirmed in uh, training practices. So, uh, yeah, the, the explanation and the reason is probably that uh, the high intensity interval training uh, will use some uh, glycogen stores and uh, based on this, uh, it will induce some uh, uh, higher keto, uh, keto uh, concentration in the blood. So uh, maybe the conclusion or some um, uh, take home message from that is that if, we, if the aim would be uh, increase ketones in the blood, so uh, we can add some uh, high intensity interval training to, to low carb diet and uh, we will achieve that. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And, you know, when we look at part of the work where we look at lean mass losses over that time frame, we're seeing losses on, on both sides of the equation and with the hit group you might have thought hey are we going to be able to protect some muscle mass there is that uh was that surprising is this a case where you know in real world practice the benefit of potentially a bit of resistance training to help protect that or what are your thoughts there yeah i was a bit surprised that the uh, lean body mass uh, decreased but uh, just to uh, make it clear and explain it better uh, as we did in our paper uh the decrease was not so substantial yeah yeah so that's the first of all and this uh, decrease uh happened uh immediately after the change of the diet in the first month and then we, we didn't see any progression so and another an explanation is probably that um, uh, some there's some limitation in dexa measurement uh, because um, a low carb diet can induce some uh, loses in the body uh, water. So hydration status can uh, influence and this hydration status uh, is shown in a DEXA measurement as a decrease in uh, lean body mass. So that, that's probably the explanation why that happened and why yeah, that's a really good point, Lucas, because <clears throat> we know that uh, water follows glycogen, right? So there's mm -hmm. the, the general formula, you know, for, for every 
gram of glycogen, you've got bound to it two to three grams of, of water, right? So you imagine in, on a low carb diet, we all know that we bleed out a little bit of, of, uh, of glycogen, stored glycogen potentially. So therefore a little bit of water is going to be lost there. So the DEXA then potentially picks up a, oh, you're, you know, you're losing, you're losing muscle mass when that's actually possibly not the case. Yeah. Gotcha. And, you know, a couple of seasons ago, I had Rob Edinburgh and he was talking about resistance training in a fasted state and, you know, the use of intramuscular triglycerides and then the fact that, you know, as that use increased, then things like insulin sensitivity is a powerful marker for improving, you know, insulin resistance and sensitivity. Is that a similar effect if we're on a bike doing hit type training? Is there potential effects like that happening with the, you know, with that hit training as well? It should be. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing, I mean, the, the, the basic signal when you're doing hit training, you know, molecularly you're it's the AMPK signal is, is hitting and which is uh, downstream is PGC one alpha, which is it's signaling for more mitochondria in the area. So it should be making more, uh, making the whole thing more fatigue resistance, uh, bringing fat into the equation more. Um, using those intramuscular triglycerides that you mentioned, and that's the mechanism. So it, it's still fantastic and great. We're not downplaying hit by any means, but it's just, yeah, we can't, you can't say that you, that's really the going to be a big factor. It, it blows the calories in calories out kind of model out, out of the water. If you, if you know what I mean, right. It didn't, yeah. you couldn't have showed it there. Right. Like it's like me, you know, you think you're going to the gym, you're going to burn more calories. So then you know, and then those calories are going to come off. It's really not what it looked like on this data set. Yeah, I mean, it's... Sorry to interrupt you. Maybe one more point about yeah. the explanation for lean body mass decrease. We need to uh, remind that uh, there was overfed participants and inactive participants. So the heat design was just walking ones. So, you know, it wasn't some strange training with... Mm -hmm. the or uh, whatever, or some uh, extra uh, high intensive um, intervals, as we know from athletes, you know, these participants were at the zero level at the beginning with the cardiorespiratory fitness level. So uh, mm -hmm. we uh, need to be very cautious. And uh, it was just a walking, walking head. So the... Yeah. It's a really good point, Lucas. Like it's, um, and again, this is why we the context is is critical here. So these were really non-functional individuals, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, like pretty obese or pretty overfat, and pretty uh, pretty sedentary. So uh, speed walking is very very challenging for these individuals. Um, but it's it's still that that's their, that's that's their level. So that's 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 high intensity for them. So yeah, it's it's nice. Well, I mean, that's the nice benefit, isn't it, of being deconditioned of high intensity it can just be something as simple as walking quickly. And, you know, you guys touched on it. And I know Martin's touched on it. The fact that the safety profile of this, even with those who are struggling with cardiovascular health is, is really quite robust in the sense of being able to, I think sometimes you know, over the years, you always heard, you know, make sure you check with your doctor, which obviously you should, but it's sort of scared people away of having any kind of intensity because they're worried about these adverse outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, everyone within their own profile um, has the capacity to do high intensity work to their own level. It doesn't have to look like, you know, your famous uh, superstar athlete that you might watch. It's just, what's high intensity for you? Yeah, it's a good one for trainers and coaches to remember that are working with the general population as well, because it's, uh, again, it's going to be relative to the client in front of them. And so sometimes when you look around at various gyms, that seems to get lost sometimes on the when the trainer is working with the client, but uh, if we shift over to the exercise side of things, you guys are measuring, you know, time to exhaustion. How did the hit training or the diet impact that? Yeah, time to, to, to the exhaustion, uh, obviously, as we expected, uh, increased in uh, the hit groups, and uh, that was actually the, the marker of our cardiorespiratory fitness level, or one of them, because uh, we couldn't see some uh, substantial. Uh, increase in VO2 max. Uh, actually, uh, VO2 max in relative uh, values increase because of uh, large uh, body mass decrease. But uh, when we look at the VO2 max in absolute values, it didn't change substantially at all. So 
um, yeah, it obviously increased that. And uh, it's not about uh, just the body mass management, but the cardiorespiratory fitness level is a very important marker of health as well. So we didn't want to just say that uh, do, do, do some diet changes and not to exercise, but exercise might be very important as well. Yeah, I suppose if we look further down the continuum as well, if you take this individual who's over fat and now we've, you know, between the dietary intervention, they're getting, they're losing fat mass. Now, in that next stage of programming, if there's a trainer or a coach, we would potentially be increasing that intensity. So, you know, could you speculate or walk us through how, you know, some of those changes might apply as, as those intervals become more intense with that, with that client? Are we going to continue to see very rapid changes? Are they going to start to, to plateau at a certain point? We didn't manipulate with uh, intensity. The intensity was uh, just uh, set up at the actually highest level because we show them the Borg scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, the aim of the training or the intervals uh, was to uh, get to 18 to 19 at the Borg scales. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we change during the 12 weeks periods was the number of intervals. So they started just with uh, four, uh, three minutes intervals. So all together it took, uh, in the first month, it took uh, like uh, 35 minutes per, in total for, for training session. Yeah. And then uh, we increased that to six intervals in the second month and eight intervals in the third month. So altogether at the, at the end of the study, it was like uh, 55 minutes training sessions in, uh, in total duration. So uh, we didn't change intensity, but uh, the volume of this uh, high intensity interval training and number of intervals. Interesting. And, you know, and Paul, if, again, kind of circling back to just if we were to, in, the, in a real world scenario, if we were to then say, hey, what, what's the next training block look like for these individuals? If we if we put them on a bike and increase some of these training bouts, are we going to continue to see, do you think, a nice rate of change? Is it going to accelerate because they're actually putting more intensity into those intervals? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's really, it's, a, it's an important question because if, if we just go back for a moment, this is a study and we're having a look at a certain thing, but if I'm taking an individual, I want to... Ideally, it depends on their context, but I, I want a blend of these things. So, I mean, I would love to see in any of these individuals that we're sort of talking about in this study, I would love to see them doing uh, some low intensity cardiovascular walking um, on the other days, right? So I, I, that's sort of what I would be programming in. And then training them really like I, I train my elite athletes. It's just, um, but it's, it, it, uh, you know, kind of a polarized approach. If they can find the time, can we get some low intensity base um, work that's in there as well? That would probably be the best road to Rome. And I would continue that throughout, you know, throughout the 12 or beyond 12 weeks as well. It's like, okay, can you, can you increase the distance or duration of those long walks? Can we find time in your day to do that? Can you get creative? Can you be, you know, can we walk to work? Uh, whatever it sort of may be, how could we potentially, you know, lengthen that time of the low intensity work as well? And then what you kind of find is like the, those that if you continue to use the model that Lucas mentioned with the, the rating of perceived exertion for the high intensity ones of 18 on a 20, uh, 20 point scale. So right yep. to the end once or twice a week for those, what you'll find is the intensity that you can go will start to get higher yeah. and the duration at that intensity or other intensities will get longer. So the, and again, these are the same when I went off on AMPK and PGC one alpha, that's what's happening throughout the whole thing in your larger fast twitch or bigger, bigger motor units in all of your muscles and your heart is growing larger as well. So all of these systems are happening simultaneously. Throw that in with diet as well. And your recovery is speeding faster too. So yeah. trainers out there, combination of these sorts of things, combination of good diet, low intensity base training, and mixed in intermittently with high intensity training, boom, you're going to get results for your clients. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And when we look at team sport athletes, you know, 
obviously the, let's say even basketball players or the amount of load that's going through and jumping, landing, accelerating, decelerating. Yet we've got players that need to get leaner through a season that are struggling with holding on to too much weight. And oftentimes for some of the, you know, the bigs, that can be something that's holding them back from even playing. Um, and you get different strategies with different training groups. And so what are your thoughts around, you know, let's say that player might not even be logging so many minutes in, in the actual games, but they're obviously practicing hard in terms of, and again, we know that context is everything and there's no sort of one, one approach, but, you know, I, I tend to see some groups either going for more of a, you know, building out that base approach. And then you see some groups that are more on the intensity side. Um, just your thoughts there with that, that sort of scenario. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think it's, I mean, <laughs> I'm going back to the same model. Yeah. Like I want to see yeah. both in my program because mm -hmm. I think that's the way human beings evolved to move. Right. And then I think we share a similar sort of philosophy on that, Mark. For sure. So I've started a podcast with Martin on, as well. It's called the Training Science Podcast, a little plug for it. Nice. But it's, um hasn't been released yet, but it's, it, um I just, Martin had a guest on the other day and he, and I was, I was thinking about you, Mark, because he, <laughs> I know you had the sort of the same philosophy. He's using it in, in Premier League football and he's, he's got sort of the um, lower carb approach, not, you know, not like we less than 50 grams, but lower carb for, for your typical average yeah. and same sort of, same sort of model in the, in the football soccer kind of context. Right. And it's, um, and he was listing, I was like, well, it's just, why wouldn't we want to do this? It's like, it's, oh, these are all the principles. Again, you've got like all these sorts of things where the mechanisms are still going to be happening. You're still going to be causing for more aerobic adaptations in your larger fast switch muscle fibers. You, you shouldn't, you should in theory. So why wouldn't you at least keep it a little bit lower on the diet, have a little bit of a, um, a lower sort of base kind of work that's in there. And that base work could also be drills and these sorts of things that are woven in. Right. But it's still, if you're measuring it from an aerobic cardiovascular heart rate standpoint, we it's, it's fairly lower intensity and mm -hmm. then explosive work as well, or um, specific work um, related to the context. If it's basketball, it might be very explosive. And if it's something like football, soccer, it might be a little bit more, more prolonged, right. Where they're having to do these high speed runs and high yep. speed why not so just depending on the context again yeah and it's always interesting how you know following guidelines and let's say team sport athletes and carbohydrate consumption has got to be between four and seven grams per kilogram and yet when we get to these scenarios where people are struggling or not achieving it, it's interesting how sometimes people will still sort of stick to the to that model. That, that, that model and not and not move into other areas to say well we, we've got to do something different because this athlete this human isn't responding to what we're doing yeah. And again, they, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm stealing the uh, podcast that I just listened to that Martin conducted it. He did a great job, but it's nice. basically, it's, it's all, it, it comes down to groupthink a lot of it. And we're all guilty of this, but we have to, we got to think, we got to step back for a moment and just like, is that really making sense? Does the data really sort of support that model? You know, I don't know. Um, but again, yeah. And, and it's like, you know, we, cause we have this model where you got it, you got to top up your stores, you're using glycogen. So, well, we got to, you know, got to fill up the gas tank. Right. But maybe there's other mechanisms that are around that are protecting that, that gas tank, you know, like gluconeogenesis and, uh, you know, all yeah. it. it's amazing that cost benefit analysis seems to get thrown out the window. Sometimes even when people are a little bit, it's, it's out of their comfort zone of the strategy they might use. And there's potential benefit there. And the risk is actually quite low of if something didn't go right. It always amazes me when the risk is actually low that people do still sometimes struggle to even adopt it versus let's say the strategy had a real high risk of something adverse happening. You could understand why people would be more prone to, to being that way. Well, this I got this reminds me of another paper that Lucas did. Um, I was on with Lucas again. So what he did, uh, Lucas, you can come in after and just correct anything. It was a couple of years back, I think. But basically, he looked at um, the whole premise with just changing over to a low carb diet. And is your VO2 max going to go down? Is your high intensity exercise um, ability going to go gonna, going to go down? And basically, you know, again, I think he used, he used a four week model and then he did it again, I think using a 12 week model yeah, yeah, exactly. and he didn't see any changes basically. Like there was no difference 
you didn't lose VO2 max, you didn't lose any high intensity capacity. Is that in, in a nutshell, Lucas? Yeah, 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 exactly as you said. Uh, yeah, you know, no big differences even after some uh, huge low uh, low carb diet. You know. Yeah, and carb. what were the what were the subjects in 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 these studies? So they were teams uh, like they were moderately they were, trained, moderately trained. Uh, yeah, moderately trained individuals, right? But it blew. Individual. It kind of it it blew all of the what we learn in the textbooks out of the water, in my opinion. And we'll we'll you know we if we can include links to these For studies, sure. we will, Mark. So. 100%. And, you know, circling back, Lucas, to the, you know, the study, your study that you talked about in this episode, you mentioned, you know, more data coming out, more papers. What's the evolution of research in this area? What, what's coming down the pipeline? Yeah, as I mentioned, we are coming with more data from this study, but uh, what's the evolution or maybe future? And uh, I must say that I'm most interested in some uh, individualization of the n- nutrition because, uh, the study we just published shows some group differences, but still we can see some uh, inter-individual or between inter-individual uh, differences. So mm-hmm. something like re- responders versus not the responders. So probably uh, we need to individualize uh, this nutrition and, uh, of course, exercise as well mm-hmm. in these participants. So. This is what I'm most interested in. I'm thinking about some new projects and uh, about this this issue. And um, Paul, I think, will say that uh, one size does not fit all. So th- this is what is uh, about the future research, I think. Awesome. Paul, your thoughts? Well, I mean, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, Lucas is spot on. The one size just doesn't fit all. Context is is uh, is God, <laughs> as we like to say in hit science, mm. and and you really have to appreciate that individual and and what their sort of situation is. And there's, I mean, there's so many contextual factors. It's funny how we've adopted this model where we just go in and we look to these studies and we look to these models, and it just has to be this way. And that's mm. just not the not the way it is. You really have to look at what's in front of you and. Um, and we're, we're in all unique animals and got to go in. And if you're a practitioner, you've got to get in there and really get to know your, your person and think about what their issues are and, uh, think about their background and then think about their goals. And you got to try to put the, all the puzzle together, but know the context first and foremost, don't give a blanket approach would be my yeah. conclusion. That, that's why we need that holistic approach, as I said, because mm-hmm. you know we are all individuals, unique individuals, and uh, you've got some uh, socio-economic differences, psychological differences as well as it's not about the physiology alone. Yeah, it's always amazing what uh, helps develop habits in one athlete or person, and the same thing doesn't do anything to help the next person develop those the habits that you want. So definitely, you know, that behavior change and, and being able to develop some patterns and some rhythms is so key. Guys, I could pick your brains all, all day. I appreciate you carving out some time. Always really insightful. You know, where's the best place for people? Obviously, the podcast coming out soon. Paul, where's the best place for people to connect with, with both of you? Yeah, for, for me, it's uh, check out Hit Science. And uh, that's that's the best place. So every, everything there is on Hit Science, the Training Science Podcast, our technology platform, Athletica, is, is really coming along too as well. Um, we've got a coach version for that too. People that are looking um, basically uses the Hit Science principles to to, to make programs. Uh, so yeah, check check us out there. Fantastic, and Lucas. Uh, yeah, from my point, it's just maybe for uh, Czech audience. And uh, my, my students, some uh, some personal blog, but uh, and websites uh, in Czech language, because uh, you know my experience is that uh, it's quite hard for Czech people to to read all the scientific uh, publications, mm-hmm. and uh, it's in English and so on. So I'm trying to uh, to reach this uh, Czech audience uh, in Czech language. So fantastic. Yep. Fantastic. We'll definitely include those all in the show notes, guys. And uh, again, once again, appreciate the time. Thanks for having us on, Mark. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for your interest and invitation. I really appreciate it.